All right, so welcome everyone to our uh, lunch talk. Uh, any announcements before we start? Anybody? Looks like it, is it? Yep. Yeah, I think everything's good. All right, so there's no announcements. Uh, it's a word on next week's talk, which is called Traversing an Oasis. Graduate student Leah Packer Grams from Ancient History and Mediterranean Archaeology will be talking about her stall funded research in Egypt. Today, we'll hear from Dr. Justin Walsh, visiting from Chapman University, is speaking about his work in collaboration with astronauts to use archaeological methods to sample locations in the International Space Station. Justin is professor of art history, archaeology, and space studies at Chapman University and at Astra, distinguished fellow in space anthropology and space habits, habitats at USC. He created the International Space Station Archaeological Project, which won awards from the AIA and the AAAs in 2023. In 2024, he was named one of the Explorers Club 50, which recognizes remarkable explorers changing the world and extending the meaning and exploration. Um, Walsh also specializes in Mediterranean archaeology, especially in Italy and Spain. He has been a fellow of the American Academy in Rome, and a visiting professor at the Institute for Advanced Studies at the University of Bristol. Welcome. <laughs> okay, thank you everybody. Thank you for, uh, for having me for this talk. Um, and before I begin, I would, first of all, actually I should say that uh, Sarah said that I should turn off my background you can't see my background. I'm in the International Space Station in my background. So I'll fix that for everybody. Okay. Um, before I begin, I do want to do a land acknowledgement and, and say that I, I gratefully acknowledge that we're convening here on the Huichin, the ancestral and unceded homeland of the Ohlone people. I recognize the Muwekma Ohlone, the uh, Verona Band of Alameda County and other native people who maintain relationships with this region. I wish to pay my respects to their ancestors, elders, and present citizens and honor this land with gratitude. I strive to hold space and value the perspectives that these people share regarding their histories, cultures, and traditions. So actually, even before I, I start my talk, and I apologize, I'm gonna be reading from a text here, uh, mainly because I have an awful lot to say uh, and a very limited time to say it. Uh, but I, I wanna put this in the context of being really interested in making connections, especially with graduate students who might be interested in collaborating on this project or other space projects. Uh, I come from a university that does not have a graduate program in archaeology, um, and so uh, there's there's so much that I'm trying to get done, and it, I, I need help. So if you're interested, I would love to talk to you after this. I'm also here tomorrow, or at least for part of the day tomorrow, uh, so maybe we can set up a time to meet and discuss. All right. This is our site. The International Space Station Archaeological Project, or ISAP, is the first full-scale archaeological investigation of the material culture from a space habitat. We take our inspiration from a phrase found in a 1972 National Academy of Sciences report, which called a crude spacecraft a micro-society in a mini-world. We use material culture as our primary evidence for understanding the site society and its inhabitants adaptations to their environment. We have developed machine learning techniques to analyze historic photos of the ISS. And here, for example, you might be able to see the little red square. We've developed an algorithm that was able to recognize the identity of the astronaut who's upside down and whose face is half hidden. Um, so that, that helps us uh, identify who's using what spaces and with what objects. We've identified usage patterns for activities such as visual crew created visual displays, conducted ethnographic observation of the only ISS material culture that can be seen on Earth, the cargo returned on SpaceX Dragon capsules, and identified population distributions across modules by gender, nationality, and space agency affiliation. So here, for example, I know it's just an uncontextualized graph, but basically you're looking at women in blue and men in, in red. And what you'll note is this is the actual population of ISS, 16% women, 84% men. And the bars for women are basically lower than that in every single region of the space station, except for one, which is the cupola, where they're represented 
of more often than you would expect based on their proportion of the population, because it turns out that NASA wants to feature women in this in aesthetically appealing part of the space station. So that was something we learned. So these are our goals. First, we want to understand as archaeologists how humans adapt to long duration spaceflight and this very weird environment that we're not evolutionarily adapted for that's characterized by isolation, confinement, and especially by microgravity. We want to understand the relationship between how space technology and architecture is designed and how it's actually used. And of course, we are interested in showing how social science perspectives and methods can contribute to life in space, because generally speaking, space agencies and the space industry see us as a soft field that cannot provide any answers that they're interested in. For this presentation, I'll concentrate on the most recent aspect of our work, the first archeological fieldwork in outer space, the first time in situ material culture was documented in a space habitat. The innovations of our work, as I hope to show here, lie along several dimensions. First, we've extended archeological techniques and perspectives directly into a completely new domain, revealing new insights about the practice of archeology span and its interpretation. Second, we're providing both contrast contrasts and complements uh, based on our direct observation of the station's material culture with the experiences reported by ISS crew members from their memories of their time on board. This allows us to identify trends in behavior and associations between people, places, and things over time, and then to compare those for diverse locations across the habitat. Third, there are implications of our discoveries for space habitats being designed now and in the future as we explore how spaces and objects are actually used as opposed to how they were planned to be used. We propose to the ISS National Lab that we perform the equivalent of one of the most basic archeological methods for sampling a site, the shovel test pit on the ISS. This was the idea of my collaborator, Alice Gorman at Flinders University. As you are aware, this is a standard way of quickly and systematically sampling a site by gridding it out and selecting one meter squares for excavation. In essence, we would sample the station's material culture by marking one meter squares on various walls with yellow Kapton tape and having the crew photograph them at the same time every day for 30 days, the equivalent of excavating a pit. The crew would then photograph the same squares at, random at a random time each day for another 30 days. Each day's photo is referred to as a context by analogy with chronologically linked ensembles of artifacts and installations in terrestrial archeological sites. And because everything in space has to have an acronym, it's a fundamental part of space culture, we named our payload the Sat Sampling Quadrangle Assemblages Research Experiment, or SQUARE. I know it's a ridiculous name, but it, it was a backronym that got us the word SQUARE, so we were happy with it. The payload required a camera, a wide-angle lens, adhesive tape to mark the corners of each square, a ruler for scale, and a color calibration card to correct the images. We selected five sample locations. Two experimental racks, one in the Japanese experiment module and one in the European lab known as Columbus. One maintenance location, what the starboard workstation in the US node two module, the galley area in the US node one module and a wall opposite the latrine and adjacent to the exercise area in the US node three module. We also asked the crew to select the sixth sample area based on what they thought might be interesting. They chose their workstation in the US lab module, Destiny. I know it's a lousy picture, you'll see a better one a little bit later on. We originally hoped to get at least one square in the Russian segment of ISS, but that was impossible for reasons that are probably obvious. As it turned out, some of our chosen areas were located where there was unlikely to be much work happening. NASA asked if we wanted to pick different areas instead, but we declined. How would we know the difference between high activity areas and low activity areas if we didn't sample both kinds? And what if an area where work was not being done became an area where something else happened instead? At 1410 UTC on January 14, 2022, NASA astronaut Kayla Barron placed the first piece of tape on the wall to mark the upper right corner of square zero one in the Japanese module. This was our small step, hopefully becoming a giant leap for archeology span in space. And uh, you know, it's a little uh, 
jumpy, the video here, but she is looking at an iPad that is strapped to her leg so it doesn't float away. It's got a technical drawing showing where to put the piece of tape on her other leg. She has a resealable plastic bag full of a ruler measuring tape and other items necessary for completing the installation. She's really floating there in space. And we were watching this, it was six o'clock in the morning in LA. I was watching this, Alice was in New South Wales, Australia. And it was two in the morning the following day there, this was 2 p.m. on the space station. And we were, I can't tell you what it was like to watch for the first time something happening in your field in space. It was, it was mind blowing. We received 358 images of the six sample locations over 60 days. On, six, on two of those days, uh, the crew actually forgot to take an image of one area. It's a sign that they're not robots or superhuman. Uh, you see some re representative images from the set here. First, the aft wall of node three near the exercise equipment and latrine. Next, the galley showing an ebook right here in the lower left corner, uh, demonstrating that someone was reading uh, actually a science fiction short story, uh, while they were eating their lunch, uh, uh, an activity that had never, as far as I know, been documented for space before. In another image of this space, we saw tubes of cake frosting in the upper right uh, attached to the wall. And we later found out from an Instagram post that you see a screenshot from on the right side uh, that this was Kayla Barron and uh, her US colleague, Tom Marshburn, making a birthday cake for a cosmonaut, Pyotr Dubrov, using muffins, honey, and the frosting. Uh, this is really interesting because it indicates cooking slash baking, which is a really unusual activity on a spacecraft that doesn't even have a stove or an oven. But it act this activity highlights how food preparation is a key vector for reinforcing social relations, even in space. Finally, the three lab locations. This is the Japanese lab, the European lab that Pink purple light is from a plant habitat just outside of our square. And but maybe you're noticing, by the way, the L's of tape that are vis visible that mark out our spaces. This is the US lab, basically their office, their shared office space. And finally, the maintenance area that I mentioned before. You can clearly see the pieces of tape at the corners. Our next step, once we got those photos, was to enter the artifact and context information in a database. For this work, we partnered with Professor Sean Graham of Carleton University in Ottawa and his MA student in digital history, Chantal Brousseau. The two of them worked on a system that would allow us to achieve multiple goals. So here is the square. And what we wanna do is tag each item within a square with a name, type, subtype, and description. Also record the location of each item by drawing a bounding box around it, allowing our team around the world to work on the photos simultaneously with the photos and data held on a server maintained by our collaborators in Chapman's machine learning and affiliated technology lab. This also added the ability for us to output the data in a variety of formats for statistical analysis, and also to train a machine learning algorithm to recognize the unusual and particular kinds of things found on the ISS for use on the historic photos that NASA has published over the last 23 years. Here you see a brief video of me drawing some bounding boxes and entering data. So this is really the practice of, of archeology. span A typical photograph could take anywhere from one to three hours to tag depending on how many items were present. The end result is an image that looks like this. We use the bounding boxes to calculate item centroids, marked by the green dots here, which is how we designate their precise locations. For today's talk, I will concentrate on the two squares whose inventories we have completed and published so far. These are squares 03 and square 05. Square 03 was located, the yellow box that you can see at upper center here, uh, was located in the Starboard Maintenance Work Area, or MWA, in the American Node 1 module. This is one of a pair of workstations located opposite one another and adjacent to a group of four crew sleeping quarters. Node 2 is a connector that links the US, Japanese, and European module, lab modules. Of all the sample locations, it is the one that is the closest to actually being a square with an area of 0.79 cubic, or not cubic, excuse me, square meters. 
The square is ostensibly a place most associated with maintenance of equipment as suggested both by its name, maintenance work area, and by historic images publicized by NASA showing its use like this one. According to prevailing design standards at the time that it was developed by NASA, an MWA, quote, shall serve as the primary location for servicing and repair of maximum sized replacement units or system components. Historic images, that's what you see in this image, historic images published by NASA showing its use suggested that a secondary function was scientific work that did not require a specific facility, such as a centrifuge, a furnace, a refrigerator, et cetera. Its primary feature was a blue metal panel with 40 square Velcro patches arranged in four rows of 10. During daily photography, many items were attached to the Velcro or held by a clip or in a resealable bag, which had its own Velcro. Above and below the blue panel were additional Velcro patches pat placed directly on the white plastic wall surface. These patches were in different sizes and shapes and irregularly arranged, indicating that they'd been placed on the wall in response to different contingencies. Some were dirty, indicating long use. The patches below the blue panel, down here, this is not from our, from our survey period, so it may look a little different from what I'm about to describe, but the patches below the blue panel were rarely used during the sample period. However, the patches above were used frequently to hold packages of wet wipes, like Huggies wipes, as well as resealable bags with electrostatic dispersion kits and other items. Outside the sample area, the primary features were a crew berth, that white thing that you see on the right side of the image, uh, and a blue metal table attached to the wall below. This table, the primary component of the MWA, quote, provides a rigid surface on which to perform maintenance tasks, according to NASA. It's modular and can be oriented in several configurations from flat against the wall to horizontal, by which I mean perpendicular to the wall. A laptop to the left of the square occasionally allowed information, uh, sorry, showed information about work happening in the area. In the 60 context photos of square 03, we recorded 3,608 instances of items, an average of 60.1, median 60.5 per context. For comparison be between squares, we can calculate the item densities per square meter. The average count was 76.1 per square meter with a minimum of 30 and a maximum of 95. 74 types of items appeared at least once here, belonging to six categories, equipment, 41%, office supplies, 31%, electronics, 17%, stowage, 9%, media, 1%, and food, less than 1%. But the really interesting data comes when we look at item function. Fully 35% of artifacts were in the restraint category. These are items that are used for holding other things in place in a microgravity environment. Clips, bungee cords, adhesive tape, cable ties, carabiners, this is compared to only 12% for tools, 9% for containers, which are resealable bags, cargo bags, mesh bags, 9% for writing items, pens, markers, notepads, 6% for audiovisual, microphones, headphones, cables, video cameras. You're getting a sense that there's a wide array of things in this, in this square, right? 4% uh, for lights, 4% for safety, which is like nitrile gloves and safety goggles and glasses, 4% for body maintenance, dry and wet wipes, 4% for power, like power cables, 3% for computing, laptops, USB hubs and cables, digital media readers, labels and, and, and drinks. Those, that makes up the rest of it. Now, one of our project goals is understanding cultural adaptations to microgravity. We place special attention on what, are call, what we call gravity surrogates, pieces of often simple technology that are used in space to replicate the terrestrial experience of things staying where you put them. Gravity surrogates include both restraints in, in, as a category here and containers. And therefore it's quite noticeable that they comprise close to half of all items, 44%. In square zero three, while the tools category, which might've been expected to be most prominent in an area des designated for maintenance is less than one third as large, just 12%. Adding other groups associated with work such as experiment and light still only brings the total to 22%. So there's an extraordinary emphasis on creating a kind of gravity in this location. 
We use the Brainerd Robinson similarity analysis to understand how similar each context is to the others in the sample. So here you see that that context by context comparison with the dark red diagonal line indicating perfect similarity because each context is being compared to itself in that spot. Dark blue, on the other hand, represents a wide difference. Now, uh, this is not necessarily the clearest thing to read, but I'll try and, try and uh, uh, explicate it. We think, or we see moments of major activity that are clearly visible in the groupings of red, red clumps of squares. We can consider these groupings to be analogous to individual strata associated with particular phases of activity in a terrestrial excavation. And let's dig into these phases in detail now. By combining this visualization, and I'll just show you like, so this would be a phase. This is a phase, this is a phase, that kind of thing. We can actually look at the photos themselves for more details and we look at this visualization and together it's our argument that there are actually eight distinct chronological periods over these 60 days. So now I'm gonna show these to you. I won't do this so much for the other square in such detail, but this is just to give you an example of, of what we're doing. So this is period one, context zero through two and zero, just because that's how the program starts numbering the, the, that we have, that we use, uh, how it starts numbering the contexts. So context zero to two, period one, a three day period of work involving a portable glove bag and a large blue stowage bag in context two. It's difficult to describe trends and fun functional types here because the glove bag and stowage bag obstruct the view of many objects. Items which appear at the top of the sample area, such as audiovisual and body maintenance items, are overemphasized in the data as a result. It appears that some kind of science is, here, is, is happening here, perhaps medical sample collection due to the presence of several small resealable bags visible in the glove bag. The work appears more intense in context one with the positioning of the video camera and the light to point into the glove bag. This is, crew, this is actually the crew being surveilled by ground control as well. A white cargo transfer bag for storage and the stowage bag for holding packing materials in the context two photo likely relate to the packing of a cargo dragon vehicle that was docked to this node, to this module. The dragon departed from the ISS for Earth full of scientific samples, equipment, and crew personal items just three hours after this, the context two photo was taken. Period two, context three to 10, was a quote unquote stable eight day period in the sample when little activity is apparent. You can see how similar they are to one another. I, I understand that they're smaller than we saw before. So maybe on some level you have to bear with me, but they're really, you get the sense of repetition, right? day after day. In this period, few objects were moved or transferred in or out of the square, and the primary function of the area seems to be storage rather than work. In context six, a large post-it note, that's the one all the way upper right, uh, a, a large post-it notepad appeared in the center of the metal panel with a phone number written on it. This number belonged to another astronaut, presumably indicating that someone on the ISS had been told to call that colleague on the ground. In context eight, that same notepad had new writing appear on it. Now reading COLA1L1, the location of an experimental rack in the European lab module. So there's something connected to what's going on there. Okay. Period three, context 11 to 12, involves a second appearance of a different portable glove bag. We can tell because it has a different serial number. This time for a known activity, a concrete hardening experiment belonging to the European Space Agency. We know this because there, there were daily status reports that were being, being published that mentioned this. And we can actually see the little vials, particularly in this image here, of the, of the samples for the hardening. This two-day phase, phase indicates how the MWA space can be shared with non-US agencies when required. And it also demonstrates the utility of this flexible area for work beyond biology or medicine, such as material science. Oversight of the crew's activities by ground staff is evident from the positioning of the video camera and LED light pointing into the glove bag. Period four, context 13 to 27, is another stable 15-day period, similar to period two. Many items continue to be stored on the aluminum panel. 
the LED light's presence is a trace of the activity in period three that persists throughout this phase. In general, the primary identifiable activity during period four is storage. And I hope that, that you're, as archaeologists, I hope you're kind of feeling like this is like, a, like reading a notebook, right? Or reading a trench notebook. That's kind of how I'm trying to, trying to present this. Period five, context 28 to 32. By contrast, this represents a short period of five days of relatively high and diverse activity. For example, in context 28, a HoloLens augmented reality headset appeared. According to the status report for the previous day, a training activity was carried out using the headset. The following day, a Saturday, showed no change in the quantity or type of objects, but many were moved around and grouped by function. Rolls of adhesive, com compare these two. Rolls of adhesive tape were placed together. Tools were moved from Velcro patches into pouches or straightened, and writing implements were placed in a vertical orientation when previously they were tilted. This context represents a cleaning and reorganization of the sample area, which is a common activity for the crew on Saturdays, house cleaning. Finally, in context 32, the last one over on the right, an optical co coherence tomography scanner, a large piece of equipment for medical research involving crew members' eyes, appeared. This device was used previously during the sample period, but on the same day as the ESA concrete experiment, so it seems to have happened elsewhere then. Context 33 to 40, period six. This is the third stable period in which almost no changes are visible over eight days. The only sign of activity is a digital timer. This object right here. Uh, sorry, is a digital timer, which was started six hours before the, the context 39 image was made and continued to run at least through context 42. Was there an ongoing experiment that needed to be monitored? Did somebody forget that they left it running? We don't know the answer to that, but that's the only piece of activity we can really point to in this period. Context 41, period seven, is a single context in which medical sample collection may have occurred. Resealable bags, some holding others, appeared in the center of the image and at lower right. One of the bags at lower right had a printed label reading reservoir containers. Oh, sorry. Uh, we were not able to discern which type of reservoir containers the label refers to, although the status report for the day mentions human research facility generic saliva collection without stating the location for that work. So that's a possibility, we don't know for sure. Finally, context 42 to 60, period eight, the last and longest period of stability and low activity, 18 days in which no specific activity other than the storage of items can be detected. Really the most notable change is the appearance for the first time of a foil water pouch, uh, which you can see in number 45 in the upper right, and then it's continually in there for the rest of the time in the central part of the blue panel. What does all this mean? Well, one thing we can do is plot Voronoi or polygons that surround each item whose areas are closer to that item than to any other one to get a sense of how different parts of the square are strongly associated with certain functions over time. So this is every one of the contexts mapped with the, the five most common functions, as you can see in the corner. And so where we see distinct patches of multiple Voronoi together, of the same color, that, that kind of suggests that that's an association with a particular function. So here we can see that restraints in yellow are associated with the left side of the square, especially the upper left. Experimental items, dark blue, are also associated with the left side, while tools, light blue, are more connected to the right side and lower half of the square. Writing items, purple, are in the center of the square. So this is just, how do we understand uh, how the crew understands the space, how the crew is organizing the space to the extent that they, they are, right? And I understand this is not the most beautiful uh, visualization. We are, this is kind of a first step. We're, we're working on different ways to represent this, this information. So stay tuned on that. But although many item types were represented in square 03, it became clear during our data capture how many things were just basically static, unmoving, and therefore unused especially certain tools, writing implements, and body maintenance items. The MWA was apparently seen as an appropriate place to store these items. Now, it may be the case that their presence here also indicates that their function was seen as an appropriate one for this space. 
but those functions may not be carried out or perhaps not in this location. So it really seems that stowage is important here. Keep a good place to store things. Now, in, in the NASA document, which is the design standards that were used at the time of installation, it says that so stowage space was only the sixth design requirement listed for the MWA after accessibility, equipment size capability, scratch resistant surfaces, capabilities for electrical, mechanical, vacuum, and fluid support during maintenance, and the accommodation of diagnostic equipment. So stowage comes after all of those ideas. Only capabilities for fabrication were listed lower than stowage. Yet, our observations show that 50 of the 60 contexts, 83% of them, fell within stable periods where little or no activity is identifiable. According to the sample results, then, this area seems to exist not for maintenance, but primarily for the storage and arrangement of items in a partly organized fashion. The MWA was also a flexible location for certain science work, like the concrete study or crew health monitoring. Actual maintenance of equipment was hardly in evidence in this, in this sample and may not even have happened at all in this location. Some training did happen here. Okay, so that's, that's what this looks like. Not what we expected, I will say. Now let's take a look at square zero five. This was placed on the aft wall of the multipurpose node three module, also known as tranquility. This module, unlike most of the others, does not include any specific science facilities. Instead, there are two large pieces of exercise equipment, the treadmill called TVIS and the lifting device called ARED. Use of these machines forms a significant part of crew activities as they're required to exercise for two to three hours each day to con counteract loss of muscle mass and bone density and enable readjustment to terrestrial gravity on the return. The waste and hygiene compartment, the WHC, which includes the US orbital segment latrine is also here on the forward wall in the center of the module. That is to say directly opposite where our square was located. Finally, three modules are docked at node three's port end. First is the cupola on the bottom of it, facing Earth, which is the most popular leisure space for the crew. Second, you can't see it, but in this location here, what's called the permanent multipurpose module or PMM, which stores equipment, food, and trash. Now in previous expeditions, some crew described installing a curtain in the PMM to create a private space for changing clothes and performing body maintenance activities such as cleaning oneself. But it was unclear whether that continued to be its function during the expedition we observed. The last space attached to node three at this port uh, is an experimental inflatable module called BEAM, which is also used for storage of equipment. Square 05 was on a mostly featureless wall with a vertical handrail, that's the blue here, in the middle. The brine processing assembly or BPA, everything's acronyms in NASA, I, I apologize, but that's just the way it is. The brine processing assembly or BPA, a white plastic box which separates water from other components of urine for treatment and reintroduction to the station's drinkable water supply was fixed to the wall outside the square boundaries at lower left. And I don't know if you're aware of that, they do drink their recycled water from their own urine, which gives rise to the kind of dark joke yesterday's coffee tomorrow. That's how they live on the space station. A bungee cord was attached to both sides of the box. The one on the right was connected at its other end to the handrail attachment bracket. Numerous items were attached to or wedged into this bungee cord, and this is the one I'm talking about right here, or into the handrail itself, as you see these plastic bags here. During our survey, bringing gravity into being. A red plastic duct ran through the square from the top center into the BPA. This duct led from the latrine behind the photographer via the overhead wall. About halfway through the survey period, the duct was wrapped in Kapton tape, as you see here. You see it's now got this orange tape around it. According to the daily status report for that day, quote, the crew used duct tape, that's what it says, duct, not capped on, but it's capped on tape, to make a seal around the BPA exhaust to prevent odor permeation in the cabin. 
revealing an aspect of the crew's experience of this area that is captured only indirectly in the context photograph. Permanently attached to the wall were approximately 20 Velcro patches in many shapes and sizes, again placed in seemingly random patterns that likely indicates that they were put there at different times and for different reasons. Other common items in Square 05 were a mirror, a laptop computer, and an experimental item belonging to the German space agency, DLR, called the Touch, excuse me, the Touch Array Assembly. That laptop moved just three times and only by a few centimeters each time during the sample period. The touch array was a black frame enclosing three metal surfaces which were being tested for their bacterial resistance. Members of the crew touched the surfaces at various moments during the sample period. Finally, and most prominent due to its size, frequency of appearance and use as judged by its movement between context photos was an unidentified crew member's toiletry kit. The square is actually a rectangle whose short sides are slightly more than half the length of the long sides. Its area is 0.7 square meters, or about 11% smaller than square 03. Here, we identified 1,831 items recorded over the 60 contexts, or almost exactly half the number for 03. Now, we can also say this as 59% of the density of items per square meter. Here's a plot of the count per context over time. Now, fewer functional types, that is say greater than 1% of the, sorry, fewer large functional types, greater than 1% of the total are present in 0, 05, just nine compared to 12 in square 0, 03. Two types, hygiene and life support, which refer to systems for keeping the crew healthy, appeared in 0, 05 that did not appear in 0, 03. In this case, we see a more even distribution between the two largest groups, restraints and body maintenance. Now, the latter was clearly the most significant here since that one only made up 4% of items in square zero three, and here it's 30%. Restraints, on the other hand, were almost exactly the same in, as in zero three, and together with containers as, remember we call them gravity surrogates, make up 40% of all items compared to 44% in square zero three, so very, very mm -hmm. similar. Here, we identified three major phases of activity corresponding to contexts 0, 05, 0 to 5, 6 to 52, and 53 to 59. The primary characteristics of these phases relate to an early period of unclear associations marked by the presence of rolls of adhesive tape and a few body maintenance items, specifically tooth, a toothpaste and a toothbrush, some wet wipes. <clears throat> Uh, it's not until the second phase that, and I know this is like, how do you make sense of this? It's maybe easier if I go back and show this image. So you can see that the, the toiletry kit appearing on the right side of the sample area, fully open with clear views of many of the items contained within. So the deodorant, uh, an electric razor, nail clippers, uh, dry wipes, etc. And this is just to, to show you this is there, basically nothing changed over this period, okay? The, it's the same set of items in the same configuration over and over and over again. And finally, you can see the toiletry kit has closed. And because that closed, we couldn't see the items inside. And so from our calculations of you know, all the objects that we have, this appears as a different phase. Now, while body maintenance in the form of cleaning and caring for oneself could be an expected function for an area with exercise and excretion facilities, it's worth noting that the ISS provides at most minimal accommodation for this activity. A description of the waste hygiene compartment, the WHC stated, to provide privacy and enclosure was added to the front of the rack. This enclosure referred to the, as the cabin is approximately the size of a typical bathroom stall and provides room for system consumables and hygiene items stowage. Space is also available to support limited hygiene functions such as hand and body washing. Now, a diagram of the WHC in that same publication shows the cabin without a scale, but suggests that it measures about two meters high by 75 meters wide by 75, 75 centimeters wide by 75 centimeters deep for a volume of approximately 1.125 cubic meters. 
NASA's current design standards state that the body volume of the largest type of individual that they design for, a 95th percentile male astronaut, is 0 0.99 square meters, meaning that a person of that size would take up 88% of the space of the cabin, leaving little room for performing cleaning functions, especially if the cabin is also used, as apparently intended, to hold system consumables and hygiene items that would further diminish the usable, usable volume. This situation explains why crews try to adapt other spaces, such as storage areas like the PMM, for these activities instead. Now, according to our crew debriefing statement, when we spoke to them after they came back, only one of them used the WHC for body maintenance purposes. It's not clear whether the toiletry kit belonged to that individual. But the appearance of the toiletry kit in Square 05, outside of the WHC, in a public space where others frequently pass by to exercise or gets things out of storage or look out the cupola windows, suggests that, uh, or excuse me, may have been a response to the limitations of this cabin. And it suggests a need for designers to reevaluate affordances for body maintenance practices and storage for related items. Now let's look at 03 and 05 side by side. I wanna do this both to respond to the total novelty of having two archeological contexts from a space habitat that we can compare, and also to validate our methodology, by which I mean, does our method allow us to characterize human activity in the area we're investigating? Does it produce results that make sense? Now, what you're looking at here is, again, all of the contexts from each one being compared to each other. And you can see that when they're compared to themselves, they're all red. And when they're compared to each other, they're all blue. They're com there's, total, there's real difference between these two, and that's not surprising. From from what we've talked about, but that's just confirmation. So here we're looking at the density of items by function in comparison. Now the typical context in square zero three had twice as many, sorry, twice as many, uh, I lost my place here, sorry, twice as many restraints and containers, but less than one quarter as many body maintenance items as square zero five. Zero 03 also had many tools, lights, audiovisual equipment, and writing implements, while there were none of these uh, types in zero 05. And zero 05, as I mentioned before, had life support and hygiene items which were missing from zero 03. So it appears that flexibility and multifunctionality were key elements for zero 03, while in zero 05, there was emphasis on one primary function, an improvised one, designated by the crew rather than by architects or by ground control, cleaning and caring for one's body with a secondary function of housing static equipment for crew hygiene and life support. As this is the first time such an analysis has been per performed, it's not yet possible to say how typical or unusual these squares are regarding the type of activities taking place, but they provide a baseline for eventual comparison with the other four squares and future work on ISS or other space habitats. Okay, oops, sorry. Now let's return to our initial questions about human adaptations to space, the relationship between planned and actual functions of different parts of space habitats, and how a social science approach like archeology's span can make a positive contribution to habitat design. Some general characteristics are revealed by archeological analysis of a space station's material culture. First, even in a small enclosed site like this one, occupied by only a few people over a relatively short sample period, we can observe divergent patterns for different locations and activity phases. Second, while distinct functions are apparent for these two squares, they are not the functions that we expected prior to this research. As a result, our work fulfills the promise of the archeological approach to understanding life in a space station by revealing new, previously unrecognized phenomena relating to life and work on the ISS. An apparent disjunction between planned and actual usage appeared in square 03. It is intended for maintenance as well as other kinds of work, but much of the time there was nobody working here. A fact that is not captured in the published historic photos of the area precisely because nothing is happening. Nobody takes a photo of something that's not happening. The space has become instead the equivalent of a pegboard mounted on a wall in a home garage or shed convenient for storage for all kinds of items and not necessarily items being used there because it has an enormous amount of at attachment points. Storage has become its primary function. Designers of future workstations in space should consider that they might need to op optimize for functions other than work 
because mo most of the time there might not be any work happening here. Square zero five, which is you know this space basically right here, is an empty space, seemingly just one side of a passageway for people going to use the lifting machine or the latrine to look out of the cupola or get something out of deep storage in one of the ISS's closets. In our survey, this, this square was actually a storage place for toiletries, but it has no affordances for storage. There are no cabinets or drawers as would be appropriate for organizing and holding crew personal items. Still, a crew member decided that this was an appropriate place to leave their toiletry kit for almost two months. Whether this choice was appreciated or resented by fellow crew members can't be discerned based on our evidence, but it seems to have been tolerated given its long duration. And the location of the other four US orbital segment crew members toiletry kits during the sample period is unknown. A question raised by our observations is how might a function be more clearly defined by designers for this area, perhaps by providing lockers for individual crew members to store their toiletries and towels. This would have a benefit not only for reducing clutter, but also for reducing exposure of toiletry kits and the items stored in them from flying sweat, from exercise equipment, or other waste particles from the latrine. I wouldn't want my toothpaste, toothbrush sticking out there. A, a larger compartment providing privacy for body maintenance and a greater range of motion would also be desirable. So, as the first systematic collection of archaeological data from a space site outside Earth, this analysis of two areas on the ISS as part of the square payload has shown that novel insights into material culture use can be obtained, such as the use of wall areas as storage or staging posts between activities, the accretion of objects associated with different functions, and the complexity of using material replacements for gravity. These results enable better space station design and raise new questions that will be addressed through analysis of the remaining four squares. Thank you. Of course, I'm happy to take any comments or questions that people might have. Yes, please. Thank you for this talk. Yeah. Oh. oh, it's got a cup. That's very, very. I like this. This is nice. I feel like Pat Sajak. <laughs> um, so Bob thanks Barker. for this. It's more Bob Barker. Bob Barker. Thank you. Yeah. Jeez, my, my game shows. Um, so the two things that made, that you made me think about in this is the and I'll let my colleague Dr. Tripsovich talk about the DPAA project he is on, but um, air crews working in cramped conditions in say bombers, um, and then naval personnel veterans who have discussed the interior of cramped operating conditions like submarines and and and, mm -hmm. and warships. Mm -hmm. um, and that those three-dimensional spaces aren't designed for the human body the way you would think, mm -hmm. right? So the air crews improvise ways to move equipment out of the way in those three-dimensional spaces so that they can work and they can move through those spaces with hanging up their uniforms on protruding 50 caliber belts or you know, whatever, sure. right? So thinking about, and this might be something for Juliet, our, our former Vanderbilt Spatial Institute scholar here, Think about the three dimensionality of that human experience in those spaces. Could do you, do you anticipate going into more of a three dimensional analysis? You know, photogrammetry, lidar, mm -hmm. these things mm -hmm. that we were playing with this morning, mm -hmm. to expand that kind of because I, I what I loved is when you were talking about you know the little cabinet for the ninety fifth percentile astronaut, right? Or or even when you had the over the overall view of the ISS with the different orientations. Mm -hmm. The disorienting nature of zero gravity, people being upside down. And yeah, whatnot. what do things look like when you're turned upside down? Yeah, right. Like, These yeah. are the so you know, and you're doing. It sounds like you're doing a little bit of the ethnography with the astronauts themselves, but thinking about that lived human experience in three dimensions mm -hmm. and how those disorienting or, or those okay. types of axes exist for them. I would wonder if you're expanding out to those three, like recording and thinking through that experience through three dimensionality, either using photogrammetry or lidar or something like that. I wouldn't say that we're necessar necessarily using uh, those those methods, but we absolutely have talked about the so the, because the light sound is a little hard to see, but this this is a kind of an image that shows you what it's like to try and I mean it's a really cluttered space, mm -hmm. exactly like you were just describing. We've actually because one of our collaborators is an, is an architect, we've talked about desire lines. So I don't know if everybody knows what a desire line is, but it's like when you have a, a concrete sidewalk that makes a right angle, 
and grass. And then you have the line through the grass that's just dirt because that's people cut the corner. That's the desire line, right? Mm -hmm. That's people want to move that way. They don't want to do that, right? What does a desire line look like when you're moving through a three-dimensional, when you're floating through a three-dimensional space? Like that's down. certainly something we've talked, because you've got the latrine sticking out into the space and you've got the, the, the treadmill and then you coming out of the ceiling, you've got the lifting device that somebody's upside down, you know, kind of lifting like that, but they're going the other direction. And all of that's happening and you're trying to get, get something out of one of the closets, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Absolutely. No, we're very much thinking about that because this, that is, you know, one of the things that this project brings up is how, uh, how much we take gravity for granted in terrestrial excavations, right. Right. in understanding archaeology in a terrestrial context. Right. So here by studying its absence, we're kind of reviewing like these are things that we take for granted down here, but absolutely the three dimensionality of it is, is something we're very interested in. You could have three de desire lines and it's probably more yes. oriented to the way that crews, what handholds. The handrails, it's exactly, right? it's all about the handrails. So you've got a handrail there, you've got them on the ceiling, you've got them on the floor. And the handrails, by the way, are not just handrails. Obviously they're, they're used to wedge things into because that's a convenient way to hold things in place. Mm -hmm. They're often used as foot rails. Mm -hmm. And when they are used as foot rails, what you'll see is that they get wrapped in foam because it hurts. Right. right. They're, they're just metal bar. They're rectangular right. metal bar. They're not designed. All of these, these, the affordances that they have are not designed for real people to use. Right. They're cheap. They're mm -hmm. off the shelf or they're just like, this is easy and we'll do it. Future space habitats are going to have to be designed to be more comfortable. Yeah. I was thinking like you could even have a cross comparative between the naval crews working on all those hard edges. You know, the, yeah. old, the older vet telling me these were built for 17 year olds who heal fast. Right. And then the air crew also, what are the modifications they're making regularly to these environments where they're having to move through these spaces without getting hung up on the accoutrement? And guess, the crew, guess right? where, guess where probably half of the people on ISS, what their background is. It's yeah, military. They're, they're aviators. Yeah. Or, or sailors like yeah. Kayla Barron was a submarine oh, right, yeah. was a submarine officer right, right, right. so yeah very cool thank you for that thank you yes please I think we have the, we have a mic that's coming to you my way great talk great project I, I thank you a... how receptive are they to all the archaeological investigation I mean you're dealing with a diverse ethnicity to begin with. You're dealing with the different crew members. Uh, I mean, how specifically the crew you're asking? Well, just how are yeah? How receptive are they? And then is it is it NASA that basically is dictating to them that they are going to participate in this, or okay. how how is that all taking okay. place in yeah. terms of the astronauts themselves? So a couple of different ways to respond to that. First is to say the reason that this project exists is because in 2015. I happened to see on Twitter that uh, NASA was advertising for a new cohort of astronauts. And I happened to look at their requirements. And they say, if you have a bachelor's degree in science, engineering, medicine, you qualify to apply. These other fields, which are adjacent to physical science, life science, engineering, medicine, but are not those things, are non-qualifying. And there was a list. And one of the things it said was social sciences. And then it said in parentheses, uh, geography, comma, anthropology, comma, archaeology. Yeah. And I read that and I thought, I don't want to be an astronaut. I'm just curious. But I saw that and I thought, what did an archaeologist ever do to NASA? <laughs> How did we even get on their radar for them to be sure that they don't want to hear from us, right? So then I started thinking like how I could show them what they were missing out on because I knew they wanted to do three-year-long missions to Mars. And if you're going to put people in a tin can for that long, you know, you want to want to know something about the society that they create and the culture that they use to structure that society, you know, so, so and I knew then that that had been clearly understudied. There was a research gap there. So that's how I started thinking about, can we do this? It was Jason DeLeon's use of uh, disposable cameras in the Undocumented Migration Project that was the inspiration for using photography here. Uh, that, that book was published the same month that those, that advertisement came out. So that was really a nice moment and gave me the light bulb. Um, but in terms of how this actually happened, it fell into our laps. It was a miracle. So we had been talking since 2018 to people at what's called the ISS National Lab, which runs all the external research in the U.S. part of the space station. So they have, an, they have uh, the ability to launch items. 
and to return items, sam like scientific samples, uh, and they have half of the cruise time. And they get to apportion that out to whomever they want. However, their stated priorities are making life better on Earth, applied research rather than basic research, the physical sciences and the life sciences, and commercialization of technology. And we don't fit any of that. Mm -hmm. But we started to talk to them in 2018. We were like, we would love to do an experiment on the space station. But anyway, we said, look, fill out our, our generic form and, and we'll look at it. And they looked at it and they actually were really interested on a personal level, the, the two folks that we were working with there. And, but there was no way it was going to happen. And so we, we started to apply to NSF. And that's a whole other story about uh, the, applying to the NSF archaeology program for funding for this, where we were told that this wasn't archaeology, even though we got an A from the internal panel. Uh, and so it wasn't going to be funded, and it wasn't. The day before that was installed, <laughs> it's a bit of irony. Um, but what essentially happened was while we were working on the, the, the grant proposals to see if we could at least get funding lined up so they wouldn't be able to say no to us, they called us and said, hey, we think we're going to have an excess of crew time coming up at the, in the late, late 21, early 22, because we've got an extra crew member up there, and a couple of experiments have dropped out that we're sponsoring. They need more time to get going. Do you have something you could propose that won't require sending anything new to the space station? Because there's a 126 step process to certify new equipment going to the space station. We've never made that timetable. So we had square. And the it didn't, uh, camera, ruler, calibration card, tape was all up there already. So for, we were actually, I think we were the very fastest experiment from proposal and, and the approval of the proposal to actual execution. It was 11 months in the history of ISS, probably the cheapest as well. Um, but uh, it just kind of fell into our laps because they remembered it and they needed something. To, they didn't want the crew doing nothing because a crew, a, a crew member's time is a million dollars a day amortized. So um, the crew do what they're told. You, write, you work with NASA to develop the procedures that they are going to follow, okay. and then they follow them. You don't ever talk to them okay. directly. Although when, when they came back, as I said, we had the debriefing. We got to ask them some questions. And we asked the questions that I asked were like, what did you think about this experiment? Which is not what any other payload uh, asks. They all ask, like, that piece of equipment, we wanted it to, to open that way. Did it open the way you wanted? Yes, no, oh, we need to read that. That's not what, we're like, what did you think about this? So we did get some window into that. They, they thought, oh, well, nothing's really changing in these pictures. Like, what are these guys going to see that, uh, down there? What are they going to understand out of this? But they did also think it was interesting that we were taking an interest in what they were doing and that it might have an effect on future space habitats. Yeah. That was a very long answer to your question. Yeah, no, no, Sorry. that's great. Great, great yeah. stuff. Thank you. <sighs> Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned sort of that, you know, this is a very inhospitable environment. It's not one we're adapted to. Um, and it's a entirely created environment, unlike most places, mm -hmm. um, that we even create gravity there. Mm -hmm. You know, we create everything there. Oxygen um, there. Pressure, oxygen, water. I mean, these are things that we don't create down here, but we create there. Yeah. Um, so I'm just kind of curious, um, you know, did any of your photos kind of indicate whether or not we create not only with our artificial gravity, you know, these attachment points, but an artificial sense of directionality, like, mm -hmm. is there a consistent up that they mostly stick to, um, you know, and that, that this isn't an environment that inherently has an up. That's absolutely right. So, so what they do, I'm going to see if I can show you in this image. So if you look uh, in the side on the right, are there, yeah, so here it says, to, there's an arrow and it says to a slash l to the airlock. So there's signage all over the place that is that is for wayfinding. That's really how they do it. But it's they've done experiments that show that when you're upside down, it becomes very difficult to orient yourself. It's very problematic. By the way, one of the other, my other passions to do with this kind of stuff is thinking about disabilities in space. Uh, so I, I collaborate with a group called Astro Access, which is working to open up space to to folks with disabilities. Uh, and you can imagine actually that if the power went out in the space station, you couldn't see anything. It would actually be to your detriment to be a sighted person, right? There are situations, and in fact, you lose your vision up there due to microgravity over time. 
So you can imagine in a three year long mission to Mars, if it takes you long enough to get to Mars that your vision is so bad as a result of being in microgravity all that time that you wouldn't be able to carry out your tasks that it might be better to send blind crew with equipment that's designed for them, right? Or the, the toilet situation, it might be better for everybody to have an ostomy. That'd be cleaner and sort out, the, sort out that issue because it's very difficult with the equipment that they have to go to the bathroom in space. So it's getting a little bit away from what you're talking about, but it, it's also sort of the, some of the problems. Yeah. Right, you don't need legs in space. Yeah. Right? So maybe you're the kind of person who already is very used to only using your arms to get around. So every, everybody in space is disabled and is disabled by virtue of being in space. That's another topic. I, mean, I could go on about this stuff all day. Mm -hmm. I'll just also mention, by the way, sorry, I've gone all the way to the beginning of the thing, two other projects that I'm working on. As I said, I was re recruiting. Uh, I have a couple other slides in here about things I'm doing. I'll just mention. So the, you may be aware of the Arecibo radio telescope mm -hmm. in Puerto Rico, which in 2020 had its instrumentation platform collapse onto it. And this is a kind of a legendary piece of scientific equipment. It's, it's, all kinds of discoveries were made with it over the 50, 60 years it was active. Um, it's owned by NSF. And uh, NSF cleaned it up real fast and I'm, with very little oversight, even though it's a, a national register site. So I have FOIA'd them for all the documentation about their cleanup and found imagery like this, which they had a committee that was, uh, that they formed that had nobody who was a heritage professional on the committee uh, that they were supposed to try and identify if there was anything historic that might be salvaged from that before it got taken for scrap, melted down aluminum and steel. Um, and so I have a huge amount of documentation of this. I don't have the time to go through it, but I think it would be a great project for someone to work on, you know, how, how sites like this get cleaned up to the point where they're no longer historic. Um, or also working on Mars, on heritage on Mars. So this is the Perseverance Entry Descending, Descent and Landing phase. This was in 2021. And this is what I like to call the archeological, the Perseverance Archeological Landscape. So you can see different parts of the rover here, it's heat shield over there, the descent stage and the parachute and back shell, which I mentioned because it was discovered by Perseverance in 2022. And then they sent the little helicopter drone Ingenuity. I don't know if you're aware of that, but that little helicopter, they sent that to uh, image it. So it's the best documented historic equipment on another planet. And I'm working on a historic American engineering record for both uh, the back shell, which was made by Lockheed Martin in Colorado. And uh, the parachute was made by Airborne Technologies in Orange County. And all of this obviously under JPL in Pasadena um, to make historic Amer American engineering records with numbers with the State Historic Office, uh, par Parks and Historic uh, uh, Properties offices in both states. And that hopefully it will get deposited in the Library of Congress and therefore would be the first heritage on another planet that would be documented to federal standards. Um, it's not just a quixotic thing. This is part of, I'm giving a talk uh, about this on Friday to a Space Futures workshop in Oakland, um, that I think heritage is a, is a window into us convincing ourselves that these are environments that we have to treat like environments on Earth. Because if we value that stuff as heritage, we should value the landscapes that they're in, and that that might help convince the space community that they need to think before they mine and do all the other things they want to do in these contexts. Anyway, so those are things I'm working on if anybody's interested, including I have squares that need to be documented uh, if you're interested in them. So I know I'm well over my time, yeah, I had a question. but yes. So uh, I'm wondering if you've looked at some of the um, technology for identifying things in the squares. Like I, I think I saw some remote sensing software that will pick out objects, automatically classify objects mm -hmm. from it might computer vision stuff. Helpful. That's where we're collaborating with our, our uh, colleagues in, at Chapman on. Sh Sean, so that, okay. uh, I'm sorry? Yeah, that so, wasn't Sean Graham. No, Sean was working on uh, the the tool that we use to to uh, manually identify okay. all of the items. Mm -hmm. but, the, but he is, I mean, he's generally involved. Yeah. But I have a, a computer science collaborator who's a computer vision specialist. Mm -hmm. He has this, the lab, has the server where all of our stuff is hosted. And the, so the idea is that yes, there are tens of thousands, if not even millions of images of the inside of the space station, they're digital, they can be put in chronological order. Mm -hmm. So if we can identify who's in the pictures, 
where the picture is located in the space station and what items are there, then we can map out the arcs of behaviors and association over the long term, mm. 24 years now con consecutive of human habitation of the space station. The tools that Amazon or Facebook or whoever, they put out open source tools that you can use for this kind of thing, but they're trained on earth material culture. Mm -hmm. The material culture of ISS is very different and also things tend to be oriented in different ways. So they, can, they tend to look like a human face, eyes up here, and then you have nose, and then you have mouth. Mm. But if you're like that, like that's why we had to develop that, that our own algorithm that recognized the guy who's hidden and upside down. Mm. Right. So we are working on that. We're, we're using our identifications of the objects in the six squares as training material for that computer nice. vision algorithm. Uh -huh. Classified, so, supervised. Exactly, classified. Exactly, exactly what it is. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Great. Um, and I think there's a couple, at least one question in the chat. Oh, um, if you don't mind reading it. Out. Yes. Thank you all for your patience. I'm like 20 minutes over. I know. <laughs> People can move. If you have to go, I totally understand. Down there, I see it. Yeah, sorry. My good space, my orientation is there. Yeah, your orientation there. I can't read that. It's so small. We can hear you all great. Okay. Do you think NASA or other organizations involved in space is receptive to learning from the implications of your research, or is this just not on their radar? Well, they definitely know about us and they like to publicize it because archaeology in space is cool, but on an internal level, like the human research program, this is not going to surprise you. They only want to do life science. They don't want to do social science. They won't fund it at all. They, they don't care. They're not interested. ISS National Lab, I, those two guys that we were working with, they've moved on to other organizations, so we don't even have them in there anymore. I would, my dream is to get trash from the space station. Because what else do archaeologists love but <laughs> trash? And we could do so much to characterize not only its, its identity from you know, the entity level to the molecular level, but also its state. And would you believe that nobody has ever looked at the trash from the space station for any reason, not biologists, nobody. And they wanna send a mission again to Mars that once you sent that spacecraft out of Earth orbit, you can't resupply it. So you have to be very careful about what you put on board. You have to have everything. Or what you have on board, you have to upcycle or reuse or whatever. Well, how can you do that if you don't know what it is? and what it consists of. So even, even when I make that case to them, they're like, so the real answer is they're not interested. It's, it's such an uphill battle, just like it's an uphill battle with NSF archaeology. Be like, no, we're really archaeology. The gatekeeping is everywhere, unfortunately. What about the Apollo mission? So actually, the, the really the, the mother of space archaeology is Beth O'Leary who recently retired from New Mexico State University. In 1999, she and some grad students actually did a project called the Lunar Legacy Project, where they tried to figure out what had been left behind at Tranquility Base. And they were able to discover, because nobody really knew, that there were 106 objects that were left behind. And the reason why nobody knew, you would think like this is super well documented. The reason nobody knew is because there were things that were left behind that weren't intended to be left behind. And she was able to identify that. Like they had eight minutes before liftoff and mission control said, oh, you know, you guys just brought all those rocks on board. You made your spacecraft a lot heavier. Nobody's ever tried to lift off of the moon before. Why don't you throw everything you don't need anymore out the door? And Beth has this fabulous map of Tranquility Base that at the bottom of the lunar module leg where the ladder was, it says toss zone. <laughs> There's a toss zone on the moon, a midden. <laughs> so yeah, uh, and, and people are gonna also, for tourism reasons, are gonna wanna go back to that. So, Heritage was always where space archaeology was from the beginning. That's why she was documenting that. She got those objects on California's list, New Mexico's list. Now they're also in New York's and Washington and Hawaii's because the states all were places where technology was developed for Apollo. But those have no legal force because the Outer Space Treaty says that no government can have sovereignty or jurisdiction over anything in space. But it was, as I say, always heritage because it seemed impractical. It seemed purely theoretical to do archaeology in space. Uh, even when I started, I started in 2008 because a student in a seminar raised their hand and said, what about stuff in space? Is that heritage? And I was like, write your term paper on that. She did, she did a great job. Uh, but it wasn't until I had that light bulb moment with Jason's photographs 
like you can use photographs as archaeological data. He wasn't really documenting it as archaeological. He was simply observing you know, the experiences of the, of the people. So it's slightly a different use of the photograph, but that was the inspiration that I said, okay, we can do something even without going there. And I would argue that this method can be used in any situation that is too dangerous or remote or difficult for archaeologists to, to, to travel to. So Sean, Graham, and I are talking about like, how can we do an environmental archaeology project on Mount Everest? So, you know, everybody, every single person who's gone to the top of Mount Everest since 1953 has taken a photo, a selfie, even before selfies, took a photo of themselves up there. And we also know the date that every one of those people was there, so we could put them in order, even if they weren't digital images. And we could look at the accretion of all of the crap left there, including people, uh, that people have left up there to understand the environmental impact of the draw of humans to the summit of Mount Everest without having to go there ourselves. So this is something we're trying to work up as well. If that was not, you know, receptive to necessarily some of this research, have your group looked into any of the um, other groups that are sending astronauts and crews into space, like Boeing, SpaceX, that they've got items docking at the ISS and coming back? So we have talked to all of those companies. Uh, they all are aware of our work. Some of them are more interested and some of them are less interested. Uh, we have looked for funding from them, and they've said, well, if we fund you, we want the results to be proprietary. As a faculty member at a university, I can't do that. So uh, that's been a real problem. So a study that we're finishing up a draft on is the usage of facilities on the ISS. That was actually, a, so facilities, I mean all the scientific equipment on the space station. Like I said, centrifuges, furnaces, glove boxes, microscopes, refrigerators, anything that they use. Um, that was a question that was asked by one of the ex-astronauts who was in the C-suite of one of the space companies who said, could you tell us that? Because we actually, we need to know what to put on a space station, right? We, can, we can't afford two decades to get this right, like NASA. We have to know what our customers are going to want. What are people using? What can we do? So we use those daily status reports, which are archived back to 2009. And we've been able to show through statistical analysis what the trends have been in different kinds of research. So I'm hoping by the end of this month, we'll have that draft finished and we'll have a preprint up pretty soon to show that. But we did that entirely unfunded. Like they're all gonna benefit from that work and none of them paid for it. <laughs> but maybe like as they see that, they'll be like, okay, it's valuable to, to support this. It's helping us. Yes, please. Oh, fascinating. And also really appreciate Kind of looking at something I would never expect to have archaeology look at. Me too. And it just, you Me know, <laughs> breaks down a lot of internal um, yeah. categories and walls. Yeah. A um, couple questions. One is, um, uh, what well, our comment, one area that strikes me where there is an interaction, overlap, and creative, um, actually, literally, the, the creative mind uh, with the technology and Space and so forth happens in the film industry mm -hmm. and in movies, obviously. Mm -hmm. And um, my question is: Have you do you know who Doug Trumbull is? And uh, have I do know the name. Okay. Well, he was the, he did all the special effects and built the models for Stanley Kubrick. Oh right, yes, we, we, I'm actually showing 2001. To, uh, I'm teaching cultures oh. in outer space as a class this semester, and my students are watching 2001 this weekend. Right. Okay. <laughs> well, T Trumbull then went on to do some of his own projects mm -hmm. and his own little film that yes. wasn't very successful called yeah. Silent Running. Uh -huh. And in that, um, he, he's applying his creativity. And here's a wonderful example, somebody who's so techie and interested in technology and making breakthroughs, but also um, imaginative in terms of how people live and act in space. Mm -hmm. And the set, he's got the situation in Silent Running very briefly is that the earth has gone to hell and there's this whole... Um, station really up in space with different ecosystems mm. and there's this one last astronaut who's kind of running it and tending it and so forth but his helpers when you mentioned about disability mm. his helpers in all this are these robot creatures which later are the inspiration for r2d2 and mm. so forth but that's another story um and these the these creatures the way he he didn't have the budget to really have uh, you know animatronics or whatever um, he had uh, amp double amputees or well people mm -hmm. with no legs literally mm -hmm. inside 
these things that he built and they walked around on their arms. Mm -hmm. They did not need legs yeah. in that particular, there was no- zero. I've got to see this movie. Yeah, so, so, and so you look at this and I mean, because Doug is, was just so brilliant, so creative. He was only 26 when 2001 was made. Uh, yeah. And, and then um, I knew him and we were going to try to do something together. It didn't happen, mm. but um, he, he kept on being, there's a, such creativity there. I bet just his notebooks would be 100%. inspirational. So, he, and uh, just an interesting thing is that the Russians filmed a feature film on ISS in 2021. Oh, did they? And it was released in 23 and I haven't seen it yet. And so they actually sent an actor and the director up and one of the cosmonauts played one of the other characters one of the professional cosmonauts who was up there played one of the other characters who i think is supposed to have a medical problem and she's the doctor the actor they sent up was a doctor okay. and they actually filmed it in the iss Wait, yeah there. and I, obviously it hasn't been released in the us but uh yeah i gotta see that one too my christmas card last year was a photo taken from the iss so <laughs> that's good and my my background is, uh, is uh, the cupola so yeah Thank you. Thank you all. I appreciate it. And if anybody wants to talk, come on up.